everybody. How's it going? I see you trickling in. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about Zoom if you're new to Zoom, but um, go ahead and feel free to type into the chat box where you're tuning in from or where you're joining us from. Love to hear where everybody's coming in from. So while we're getting settled, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Zoom. If you're new to Zoom webinar, I'm going to run through a few things to quickly familiarize you. You'll notice your microphone is muted. That's why we can't hear you talk. And that is because with so many of us here together, it's best to give everyone the best chance to hear clearly without each other's background noise. Throughout this webinar, there are two ways to interact with us through the Q&A or the chat box. With hundreds of you on this webinar right now, we've decided it's best to hold all questions until the end of the webinar to ensure we have enough time to get through everything. Um, after Lori, Jeremy, and John's presentations, we'll go straight into Q&A for about 15 minutes. If you have a question for one of the speakers or anything related to the presentation, please type your question into the Q&A box below in that black toolbar at the bottom of your computer screen. Or if you're using a smart device, such as an iPad, the toolbar may be at the top of your screen. If you can't find it, go ahead and just give your mouse a little shake and you should see it come up. If you have a question for me about Zoom or about friends, maybe you'd like to receive emails about how to get involved or stay updated with future webinars, please type your question into the chat box. If you accidentally leave a question for one of the speakers in the chat box, please know it may be missed because we are watching the Q&A. Ask me a question in the chat box, see the chat icon again at the bottom of your screen. Type your question and click enter to send. Please know unless you send this question directly only to me, everyone on the webinar will be able to see your question. For the largest viewing options of your speaker on your computer screen, click speaker view at the top right hand corner of your Zoom screen. This enables whoever is speaking to be the main face or screen you see. We are recording this webinar and we'll post the video online soon within a few days for folks who are unable to make it with us tonight. KWSO 91.9 Warm Springs Radio is also recording this webinar to share with their listeners in the next few weeks. Every one of Friends' webinars are posted on our YouTube channel as well as our website at gorgefriends.org. All right, I think that wraps up most of the Zoom items. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy lives to join us right now. My name is Natasha Stone and I'm your host and moderator this evening. I am the Community Engagement Specialist at Friends of the Columbia Gorge. As Friends' Community Engagement Specialist, I manage our outdoor youth education efforts and work to build a diverse and inclusive network of community partners to help protect, preserve, and steward the Columbia Gorge. We have a great discussion ahead of us with the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, CRITFIC, to talk about the Pacific Northwest's most ancient native fish, the Pacific lamprey. Records of lamprey fossils have dated back as far as 450 million years proving this ancient fish lived amongst dinosaurs and survived mass extinctions, including the Ice Age. While outlasting countless other species in recent times, the Pacific lamprey saw its populations decline, almost going extinct in the 1990s. Critfic and its member tribes, including the Nez Perce tribe, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation, and the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation of Oregon, have been leading a successful restoration program to keep these critical fish in the Columbia River. We are very fortunate to hear from three speakers tonight who have been working hard to put lamprey and other fish back in the rivers. I want to welcome Lori Porter, John Hess, and Jeremy Five Crows. Lori Porter is the lamprey project lead at the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. Lori has an undergraduate degree in biology and a master's degree in cultural and environmental resource management from Central Washington University. Lori is passionate about working for the conservation of Pacific lamprey. She considers lamprey a unique and interesting fish to work with as it is an ancient fish, relatively unchanged from its ancestors with still many mysteries to uncover regarding its life history and behavior. Lori is enrolled with the Lacoudere Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. John Hess received a PhD in ecology, evolution and population biology at Washington University at St. Louis, Missouri. For research, John tends to gravitate toward what he calls misunderstood species with funky teeth. Having studied the population genetics of naked mole rats for his dissertation, and more recently, the population genetics of Pacific lamprey at Critfic. His general research focus at Critfic is in the application of parentage and genetic stock identification to fisheries management and understanding the genetic basis of fitness traits. Jeremy Five Crows is Critfix public affairs specialist. He was born and raised on the Nez Perce Reservation, 
growing up traveling throughout the Nez Perce homeland with his family on hunting, fishing, and berry picking trips, instilled in him a strong sense of place and a dedication to preserving the environment. This only increased while living in Norway, where he witnessed Norwegian's dedication to cherishing and protecting the environment. He's confident that he is the only Nez Perce Indian who is fluent in Norwegian. Jeremy has a degree in conservation biology from Brigham Young University. Before I hand it off to the three featured speakers tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit about Friends and how we're all here right now, just in case you are new. Friends of the Columbia Gorge is the only conservation group entirely dedicated to protecting, preserving, and stewarding the gorge. And I just realized I need to put on my presentation real quick, you guys. Real quick, let me share my screen. <laughs> Perfect. And hopefully everyone can see that great. Give me a little nod if you can. Perfect. <laughs> Um, as I said, Friends led the fight to protect the gorge by helping create the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area over 40 years ago, and it's been working ever since to safeguard the gorge and make sure the natural wonders found today will be preserved for generations to come. Friends is entirely dedicated to protecting and enhancing the scenic, natural, cultural, and recreational resources in the gorge. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Jeremy to share your screen after I stop sharing mine. There we go. And I'm going to ask you, Jeremy, to start us off. Our first featured speaker, Jeremy Five Crows. And then Jeremy, you're still muted. Friendly reminder. Okay. All right. Do we have it up on screen? Yes, looks great. All right. Well, I am very excited to be here tonight. Uh, talking about like one, this is like my, one of my favorite species uh, here. Um, in the Columbia Gorge of, or the Columbia River is uh, Pacific Lamprey. Uh, like, uh, like I said, um, I, my name is Jeremy Five Crows and uh, Lori and John and I all work for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, which is a, 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 an organization that uh, the Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs and Nez Perce tribes uh, created to protect and uh, protect and restore uh, the, the fish, primarily salmon at the beginning, but then lamprey as their numbers started to dwindle, which we'll get into um, as the uh, presentation goes on. And uh, so the what I'm going to be talking about before I turn it over to Lori will be kind of like the, the lamprey's connection to humans. Um, and kind of like why they're they're special. And uh, this this is something that's really kind of dear to my my heart personally. Was uh, my dad was um, Elmer Crow with his purse, and he um, uh, kind of dedicated the last years of his life on restoration efforts as well as advocacy for lamprey. And uh, in fact, his name was Elmer, but he often was called Elmer because he was so. Uh, associated with uh, with this with this fish and lamprey they are there's a lot of people even for people that are the like lifelong uh, residents of the Columbia uh, basin are uh, there's a lot of people that are unaware that lamprey are even found in the river and that they're native here and so it's kind of surprising when people like see them and they might not even know know anything about them or, or if they then they see pictures or see them at Bonneville Dam in the windows, they'll kind of like have a negative reaction because they think that they, these are kind of like these scary creatures. Uh, and I'll admit the, um, they are, not, they're not the most photogenic fish, um, you know, in, in the basin with that uh, disc sucking mouth and the, 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 the teeth and the, the way that they swim and kind of look like a, like a snake. Uh, but I, but I'll, um, they, uh, they kind of grow on you especially as, as you learn more and more about them. And here in Oregon, we're kind of in a lamprey hotspot where uh, there's 40, around 40 species of lamprey are all over the world. Um, and Oregon actually has uh, a, a high number of those, um, I mean, of the more so than in a lot of places in the world, uh, we're kind of like a, a lamprey hotspot. Uh, but um, when I say here that they're not the most photogenic, but it could be worse. I, so here's a picture of a the one of the lamprey species that's found in uh, the southern hemisphere in New Zealand, Australia, Chile, and Argentina. So, uh, you know, with with the, the this poor pouched lamprey, I mean, it's uh, it's even lower down on the level, I guess, on the photogenic level than ours. So it makes uh, makes our Pacific lamprey look uh, downright adorable in comparison. 
Um, historically, the, the lamprey were, they had a range that went further than salmon just because they were able to climb up uh, some of the passage barriers that the, uh, that block salmon. Uh, here's a, here's, this is a photo from the early part of the 1900s at Willamette Falls where the, they would, the lamprey would just build up and uh, prepare to climb, to, to climb up over the rocks. And they would, uh, th with that sucking disc mouth, they could climb pretty high uh, obstacles. And they, you know, so the set, like uh, Shoshone Falls in Idaho is a, is a salmon uh, blockage, but lamprey could get past them. Uh, and so there's other examples of, of waterfalls that would normally, you know, they, they block salmon, but lamprey kind of went a little further. And just like the salmon, they represented a, a really big um, you know, kind of food source, calorie source with all these nutrients from the ocean that were returning to the river and, uh, and upstream. And, and so the, the, just like the other, other foods that the tribes took advantage of, they took advantage of this amazing resource in terms of uh, nutrients and uh, that uh, was, was coming to the, to the river with them. So this, this connection to the lamprey is, is, is really strong uh, to, as part of the, 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 the gathering of this, as well as the consumption of this and kind of the, the stories around this, um, our connection to, to this creature. Uh, this is some photos of some um, historical photos of lamprey harvest at, uh, in various areas in, along the Columbia. The first, the, photo on the left of the little boy, he is, um, this is at Celilo Falls. And this was a common thing to do uh, at Celilo Falls was to send the younger kids to gather the lamprey because uh, the fishing from the scaffolds right over the, the, the actual falls was pretty dangerous. And so you had to be older to be able to, to kind of safely navigate that. And so kids were often tasked with going to the little pools down below where they could uh, just kind of pick them up out of the water and, uh, and do that harvest there in that way. Uh, in the upper right, you can see here's a, a, a fisher also at Celilo who is um, repairing a net. And in the foreground, you can see there's a, there's some, uh, a couple of lamprey that are drying that he'd caught to uh, just dry in the sun. And, um, and then down below that, that is a, a fisher using it. This is a traditional lamprey net uh, to, to fish um, from a canoe on the Columbia River. So once they uh, harvested them, the, 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 the two most common methods to prepare them was to stick roast them. And you see there the both on the left as well as in the lower right of um, uh, just over the fire. And sometimes the uh, oil, they're very oily fish. So when they're cooked, the, the, they would uh, have put bowls underneath the, the cooking fish to kept, collect that oil and use it for other purposes. And then the other um, method you can see in the upper or the low, the upper right where it, they were dried on racks. And uh, but either way, they, they were they really would preserve them uh, for uh, for use uh, not only directly when they caught them, but for for later. And this still continues on today. This is the uh, the lamprey harvest at Willamette Falls. And uh, every year, uh, tribal members and predomin predominantly it's youth that are that are sent over one because it's to kind of help instill in them that connection to the resource uh, and to to lamprey and as well as that they're the, the young and agile ones that are can kind of just like clambering over all the, the rocks and getting into the little nooks and crannies to um, to uh, gather these the lamprey that build up there. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see in the, the, the photo on the upper right, uh, kind of, I, I love the, the melding of the ancient and, and modern with the kind of doing this ancient uh, fishing thing of going into these pools, but like with these, the modern uh, snorkel gear is kind of a nice touch, I thought. Then when they bring those, those fish back, the, um, they're prepared and they're in, in the, the tribes of the, plat the Columbia Plateau, there's a concept called the first foods. And these are the foods that the creator gave 
the people that lived on this place to provide them sustenance. And these foods are um, the salmon and lamprey, uh, the game like deer and elk, um, and the berries like huckleberries, choke cherries, um, and then the roots like camas, cows, and all those. So as one of the first foods, there's a lot of like kind of a, a very value, valuing of it, rest, respect of the resource, as well as a lot of traditions involved around um, the the use of these of these fish. And so when the the harvest the annual harvest happens. And people will uh, get the the um, fish. It's kind of like a cause for a community celebration, and uh, and it really was felt in the years as the, the as, as they declined in numbers, where like a lot of the elders will ask, "Are there going to be lamprey at the, at this year's feast?" And you know, sometimes they have to say no, and other times they, when they do have them, it's met with a, a lot of uh, of happiness to be able to continue that tradition. Uh, in fact, Willamette Falls, uh, when the, all the photos I was showing before were all at Willamette Falls. That's kind of like the last stronghold for uh, uh, lamprey to return in harvestable numbers. They uh, uh, elsewhere uh, in the basin, because of the hydro system, the, they, their numbers have dwindled a lot, uh, not just the hydro system, but um, there's also been active eradication things that uh, that will be covered later on in the presentation. But um, the fact that there's no dams between the ocean and Willamette Falls really helps the the you know, keep those numbers uh, up enough that there's a there's a harvest. And uh, yeah, so that's where that happens each year there. So really, it's nice that I mean to, to kind of convey that the, the this is a ancient tradition and it's an ancient resource that the tribes have used but also that it's one that's carried on today that we still have that connection we still harvest them we still eat them we still take them part of our ceremonies and our feasts and in in a ways that um that really is not as uh you know not even uh people that are newcomers to the area aren't even aware that, you know, sometimes aren't even aware the fish are even there and certainly not, don't have that connection to, to the animal. Um, and in fact, one of the, one of the examples of when it kind of like they did it intersect or are often to see them as uh, their bait, they'll, they'll gather them for bait or um, here, this is a, an old photo from the fifties of using, collecting them for um, medical research. But really, there's not many um, interactions of how the non-tribal public uh, were making use of uh, this resource that would come in each year. Uh, but it, and that I think that separation leads to a lot of of um, uh, misperceptions of what lamprey are, or they kind of like really play off of the idea that they're they're scary or that they're kind of alien, uh, and so. But the thing is that when we do see this crop up is in pop, you know, kind of the broader pop culture is in that aspect of it, that there are these monsters. Here's a photo of them being featured on an episode of the Discovery Channel program, River Monsters, you know, playing up the call. That was the episode, the name of the episode was Vampires of the Deep. So really playing off of the, uh, you know, the blood sucking aspect of that. Uh, and then uh, sometimes, uh, depending on uh, how how old old you are, someone a lot of you might remember the um, the sea lamprey invasion getting worse and worse in the Great Lakes, and which it was a result of all of the canals that were built in the uh, along the St. Lawrence Lawrence River that allowed sea lamprey, which are the uh, the Atlantic lamprey, able to populate the Great Lakes, and so people really had a negative connotation to lamprey in general. And, uh, and so that kind of extended to all lamprey. Uh, in fact, we still see that when we do presentations and efforts for education of people reacting initially with like, wait, why would you want to save those? Those are invasive, they're, they're bad, they're ruining the environment where it's, it's really uh, two different, uh, different aspects there. Uh, but that really kind of like, you know, added to, to the problem. And so till we get these extremes, like here's an example from uh, a few years ago, an Animal Planet show called Blood Lake about these killer lamprey and, you know, making them out to be these monsters that would like jump out of the water and attack, attack people and, uh, you know, kind of run amok. 
um, or uh, but really, uh, you know, playing off of this perception that they're they're this uh, this strange monster and something to be avoided. Uh, but other places where it's more more positive, I, I think, are examples of uh, like the uh, the in World War II. When I was doing research for this program, I discovered this uh, this the um, submarine that fought in World War II called the USS Lamprey, and I loved the their the the, the logo for their uh, the the ship was that nice Lamprey that's uh, that's riding on the torpedo to to sink the sink the Nazis. So that's kind of like a, a nice little po positive note there, I guess, with Lamprey entering into the into the broader culture, and a more recent one, which I think is funny, is this idea that uh, or this that there's a there's a Pokemon a Lamprey Pokemon. So it's like it's it's weird how doing research for this presentation, bringing up these random uh, Pokemon, I mean random Lamprey connections that we still kind of see remnants of in in, uh, in just in our everyday everyday lives. So these are examples of the, uh, you know, lamprey here in America and how, the, you know, the tribes are really connected to them, but the broader population isn't. But uh, moving over to um, Europe where people lived with lamprey as well, and there's whole um, kind of cultures and, uh, and cuisines based around them uh, that I think a lot of Americans don't even real, really realize. Um, so that there's, uh, I think whenever lamprey interfaced with human societies and cultures, they, the humans would, would um, utilize that resource. Uh, this, this image from the Middle Ages is a, um, um, from a, an illustration that's, that's in Austria. And uh, you can see the, the, the person that's, that's fishing for the lamprey at, in the bottom is using what looks like, just like what a tribal fishnet um, is, that they use right now. Uh, so that's part of like their harvest. Uh, an extreme example of this is uh, in the city of Arbo, Spain, where uh, they, in fact, if you notice that the, the town seal includes two lamprey on it, and they have, they've built these, in fact, these date from the Roman at times, but they're called pesqueras, and they are, um, these rock structures that were that are man-made that are built to that are designed to kind of concentrate the lamprey to go through those narrow slots, which makes it easier easy for the fishers then to reach down and dip the uh, lamprey up out of the water, just like you were seeing at, at Salilo Falls. And these in the the lamprey was like a, a like a not only you know just like the commoners would eating it, but it was like a royal treat. In fact, uh, King Henry the first died from eating too many lamprey. In fact, that's what that's what the his his uh, actual the the doctors on his death certificate said that he died of a surfeit of lamprey. So he really enjoyed the lamprey. Um, but uh, and, and yeah, and, and it's not like they're lamprey are poisonous. It's more of that if you eat that much oily food and you're not very healthy, it's not really good for your heart. So I'm I, I'm not sure of all the details there. It's kind of lost to history. But uh, um, and then right on the right hand side, you'll see that that's the uh, a, a lamprey pie that was. Um, baked for Queen Elizabeth's Golden Jubilee. And uh, so that's still kind of like this part of the tradition to uh, that in with the with the royalty. And uh, a fun an interesting thing about that that particular lamprey pie was because the the conditions had gotten so poor there's not enough harvestable lamprey in England still. And so all the lamprey had to come from Canada to uh to to be baked into that uh and then to uh kind of uh this is a a reminder about this uh the royal the royal aspect of uh lamprey as the a, a couple years ago when i was watching an episode of game of thrones uh, this this clip came on and it totally just caught me caught me by surprise excellent lamprey pie were you slaving away in the kitchen all day? So I was, I was like, when I saw that, I was like, wow, that's like, like, like the lamprey have arrived when they're be, like, they're right there featured in, uh, in um, Game of Thrones. Uh, but uh, 
th this is how some of the dishes, lamprey dishes that are found in um, in Europe. If you were to go to some of these places where there's there's lamprey as well, where uh, you see the lamprey with a, in, in an egg uh, dish on the right from Spain, and the upper right is a lamprey and rice dish. That's uh, that's kind of one of part of a region in Portugal is well known for. And uh, in the bottom right, it, or they, you can buy tinned lamprey uh, in like sometimes are packed in oil, sometimes in tomato sauce, just like just like uh, sardines. So they're um, they're cherished in in all in these places as well. They're really kind of part of like this broader culture of people making use of this resource. Uh, so they're very very special uh, uh, fish, and uh, we 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 we. We like them. We try to make make use of them, and, and then also to uh, protect them. Um, so moving on, the I, I'm going to in preparation to turn it over to uh, Lori. I was going. I'll, I was going to point out some aspects of them of why lamprey. What make them so special? Um, and the a lot of it is just how old and long lived that this this species is. Uh, there, it's an ancient family here on the top. There's a, this is a fossil lamprey, adult lamprey. That's a 350 million year old lamprey. And uh, below is a, a fossilized juvenile uh, that's 125 million years old. So, and the, both of these, the, their body, they, they, they look almost just like a modern lamprey. So they're, they're, they found something that worked and they, uh, and they are living, I mean, so kind of like literal living, living fossils. And to give an idea of how kind of where that fits in terms of like how what they've seen, um, I was going to run this timeline of, uh, of uh, the earth since since the what's happened since lamprey appeared in the fossil record. So here they are at 450 million years ago, them first appearing. Uh, then, you know, it took 65 million years for the first trees to appear on uh, in the fossil record. Uh, look at that there, then another 100 million years before the first beetles ever appear. And uh, the other, the other um, kind of ancient dinosaur fish that we always think of is sturgeon. So when the, when the sturgeon appear uh, on earth, the lamprey were already had been around for 250 million years. Uh, you could see it. the other interesting point there too is that the, uh, they also saw North America breaking off from the uh, a bigger land mass and also that was the, at the time when Saturn's rings uh, started to develop. So you, th you don't think that these these fish are older than the, than the rings of Saturn is pretty impressive. Uh, then moving forward, I mean, look at these the, the, these newcomers here. The, the salmon don't appear in the fossil record for, another, for until six million years ago, with humans, you know, very like these newcomers at a hundred hundred thousand years ago. And that line to give the idea of how how recent that is in comparison for this scale, you'd have to zoom in. It's like the between when humans showed up and today is that one pixel of. Uh, of that timeline, so really they are like the elders of this of this area, and um, and that's why kind of like make them special, but also to, to, and to honor them. And uh, yeah, so this is what uh, they how how kind of uh, you know the the things that they've their their um, form they they have a, a a body type that just works for them. And so there's been all, when we think of all of this advances and progress that the vertebrates have made to make, you know, fish and amphibians, mm -hmm. those, those are all pre, uh, lamprey predate all of those, you know, it's like they don't have jaws, they don't have lungs, they don't have limbs, they don't have, you know, just all of these things. And, uh, and so they are like the very most, you know, the very first vertebrates that showed up on earth. And, uh, so that make they were very, um, kind of like, Oh, again, like I said, that there there are elders here, and they're very unique, and they have a very unique life life cycle um, as well. And so I'm going to take that opportunity now to turn the time over to Lori Porter, who's going to talk a little bit more about those things. Okay, you can take it away, Lori. 
All right, so am I sharing my screen? Yes. Yes, looks great. Great. Thank you, Jeremy, for your section. And um, so as Jeremy mentioned, my name's Lori Porter, and I'll be sharing the uh, biology of lamprey, as well as uh, I'll be discussing a little bit about the conservation and restoration efforts little bit about the Kritvik member tribes and their lamprey programs, and then uh, go into some of the work that's being done at the dams. And I'll, I'll finish this up with a couple of graphs that show us um, the 10 year average for the lamprey run. So first off, as Jeremy already mentioned, these are really unique fish. They have unique characteristics. Uh, one of the most interesting parts of them is as you can see their mouth, with their suction disc and their sharp teeth. This is what allows them when they become juveniles to be able to go out and live in the ocean and uh, attach to their hosts. They, are, they lack scales, they don't have bones. Um, they've got that third eye that's a uh, light sensor and uh, they have two dorsal fins, a caudal fin, but they lack paired fins and they lack a swim bladder. So, but they're very interesting fish and they use anguilliform swimming, which is kind of this sinuous, uh, sort of like an eel or a snake swimming motion. And why is it not moving forward? Okay, so I'm having a problem. You're okay. Forward. Maybe if you click your mouse instead of your keyboard, who knows something funky might be going on. Okay, there. All right. So I'll start with the life cycle of Pacific lamprey. So they are anadromous, and so that means they are beginning their life in the uh, fresh water. They'll go through, they'll become their larvae, they go through a metamorphosis where they um, get those teeth, and then they make their way out to the ocean. In my following slides, I'll, I'll go into more detail about that. Now, uh, looking at Pacific lamprey distribution, they are distributed all along the west coast of North America, up into Alaska, over to um, off the coast of Russia, and all the way to Japan. So Pacific lamprey are known to make long transoceanic migrations. And we really don't know, you know how they decide they're not philopatric. They don't return to their uh, natal streams. So we, we don't really know what determines when they drop off of a host fish and decide to come back to where they want to uh, spawn. But um, you can see here the multiple types of fish, including marine mammals, sharks, and a variety of sizes of fish that they will uh, use as hosts. I think that's part of what's made them successful. So that if there comes a time where one of their um, hosts is, is in, in uh, poor condition or uh, numbers are low, then they can choose some other um, fish to hang on to. And they don't harm their hosts. So they just, they um, suck the blood. When they fill up, they get off and they don't cause uh, too much damage. So we'll talk about first their, um, I'll start at the adult migration phase. So this is when they're just returning from the ocean. So they're beginning their freshwater migration. Now Pacific lamprey, the majority of them are going to need to overwinter at least one winter before they spawn. Um, so they'll be coming into fresh water somewhere between May through November, uh, and then they'll, they'll make their way to uh, 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 an area of cold, deep water. And as the summer temperatures rise or conditions become not, not good for them, they, they find that little hole and they'll hunker down um, for the winter. These pictures show you one of these, uh, on the right are some adult migration phase Pacific lamprey in the window at Bonneville Dam. And you can see the color, they're kind of that bluish color. They're very long, they're dorsal, or um, you can see that uh, to me, they look like they're immature. They're not ready to spawn. As they become ready to spawn, they'll change color and change shape a little bit. So we'll go to the next slide. Here is where they're spawning. Now, when lamprey, uh, go into their spawning migration, they will um, 
So after they overwinter in their deep holes in the cold water, about early spring, and it depends on which tributaries they're going to, but the, in early spring, as the cold waters begin to warm up, they start their final migration, which is the spawning migration. So they're make, they'll make their way to their upper reaches of the tributaries, finding locations that are um, good for spawning. Uh, they are known to be um, attracted to larval pheromones or scents released by their larvae, and they don't have to be a family. Um, they will just they will be guided to any larvae um, scent, and so that just tells them, hey, this is a good place. These larvae have survived, so I think this is probably a good place to spawn. Notice they spawn with multiple partners over multiple days or weeks. They, they are known to uh, die after spawning and it might take a few days to a few weeks. Now, some may say that maybe um, some don't die. So, you know, we're always learning more about lamprey, but for right now, what we know is that we believe they do die after spawning. Um, speaking of their long distance migrations, like Jeremy was saying, you know, all the way to Shoshone Falls and above in the Upper Snake River, you know, 700 miles to this place on the Bruno River, over 900 miles upriver. Um, that was before the dams. So if there's nothing in their way, they're going to go as far as they possibly can to the best, best places to spawn. Uh, the picture on the left is sometime like the 1900s and 1910, I think it said, but what I notice about that picture, um, besides being sad about the fish, um, is that those fish look really long. And so John, when he talks about the um, genetics, he'll talk to you about the long-bodied, short-bodied, um, or large-bodied, small-bodied fish. Large-bodied fish tend to make their way up to the upper reaches of the Snake River. You know, they can vary in size from anywhere from like 350 centimeters to about 700, a very big range. Uh, smaller fish tend to be on the coast, larger fish are, are further inland, which makes sense because they cease feeding, you know, to move up river. And so they've just got to live off of their, what they um, put on during their, their time in the ocean, which I forgot to say, time in the ocean can be anywhere from zero, like not even a whole year, to possibly six years. Uh, and it could even be longer. Again, we're learning things every day. So once they have spawned, they lay approximately anywhere from 98,000 to 238,000 or, you know, somewhere around their eggs. Um, that's a lot. They're about 1.5 millimeters in diameter and uh, they'll develop until about, oh, you know, on average, whoops. Um, on average, about 19 days to hatch. And of course it varies based on river, water temperature and other factors. So could be a little earlier, could be a little later. Uh, and then they'll be in this pro-larvae stage till a, for another about 15 days. So if you see this, how they're developing in that picture on the right. And then eventually um, they're ready to leave the red and uh, head, they sort of drift downstream. Here they are as what we call amlocetes or larvae. This is, they've left the red. They're now, uh, they burrow into the fine sediments and they're often called the um, earthworms of freshwater or cleaners of the streams. I like the cleaners of the streams. This is one of those things where this is what they, how they benefit the ecosystem in which they live and all the fish that share it with them. Um, so here you can see their mouths. I think they're really cute uh, when they're at this stage, but uh, so you can see they have that what's called the oral hood and then they just water passes through and they um, filter feed on things like uh, detritus and um, uh, algae um, and then they just they move that sediment around. Um, so they're just really great at providing some benefits to the streams. Now, at some point, they end up going through what's this metamorphosis, this transformation. And uh, that can occur um, big range, you know. We've heard of some transforming at one and a half years in the, during, from art, artificial propagation. 
Um, that's real early, but we also know now that there's some 10 year olds that head out, you know, that have been collected on at, at Lower Granite Dam. So we know that, you know, they have a big range, but here we'll say they average about four to seven years before they transform. And that transformation takes about anywhere from about 105 to 150 days to complete. And here's where they'll, um, this is when they go from being the blind filter feeder to getting eyes, their, uh, their little suction mouth, their teeth, and they become better swimmers. As amaceids, they're not really, they can swim, um, but that's not what they, they, they're not really swimmers. But when they become transformers, yes, they can swim. And they also, though, ride along on um, debris and vegetation when there's big freshets, when there's, you know, those spring floods. Uh, and so to say when they leave the fresh water is, um, it just varies. You can't even put a date on it. But some areas like out of the Umatilla River Basin, those fish tend to come out in the winter at those big freshets. Winter could be, I could be saying December, January, February. And then in other areas, they're coming out later, spring, February, March, you know, and then there might be some summer pushes. So, you know, it just varies. But anyway, um, talking about their length, they're about 150 millimeters in length and at this, when they're these transformers. Uh, when they were larvae as amacetes, when they're just about ready to transform, they're a little longer sometimes, they shrink a little bit. So, so I'm making the circle. I've just circled us back to the ocean. So that transformer, you know, it, 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 it went 115 days. It got ready to be in the estuary. It hopped on some kind of fish. And then as it grows, it drops off and, and hops on other, other fish is what we believe. Um, and so here there's some lamprey on a whale's tail. Um, now these might not be Pacific lamprey. The whale could be, um, but they, so this kind of tells you, wow, how far is this lamprey going? And when does it decide to drop off? And where is it when it drops off? So these are all questions that are not answered. Now we're going to move into what I said, how I said, now we're going to move to threats. Um, and, but, but this first, the first predation slide uh, is two things. It, it shows that they um, experience a threat because they're predated on by a lot of uh, animals, fish, and, and birds. But what it also tells us, one, they buffer salmon from predation. So if you don't have a lot of lamprey, your salmon are, they're going to suffer um, because lamprey, everything likes to eat lamprey. They're like that fat hot dog to eat. And so um, you can see there's, they, the larvae are eaten, the uh, juveniles, and the adults. So they also provide marine derived nutrients to fresh water. And not only that, but now these mammals take, grab it or the, the birds grab that fish and then they take it back to their nest when it drops down on the ground. This provides um, fertilizer to trees, plants, vegetation, et cetera. But I love the picture in the lower left because that shows you that's a seal or a sea lion. Could be, I think a sea lion. But anyway, eating a, <laughs> eating a lamprey and then a eagle stealing it from them. So, you know, this just tells you how important they are. So now, and then, but also predation's a threat because they're predated on and so that, that hurts them. And also, especially with non-native fish, you know, or non-resident fish in the Columbia River. So, but other threats that we see here, uh, multiple threats. So. Passage is the biggest, one of the biggest uh, climate change, water quality and quantity dewatering. So that picture on the right hand side, um, this is a canal being dewatered and they're um, rescuing the amacetes, the larvae that are in that, uh, in those, in that sediment and thousands upon thousands are desiccated when things are dewatered or when dredging occurs and the dredging it, uh, material is dumped out on the earth, thousands of thousands. But anyway, and then also um, things like road crossing, you look at this um, culvert here. Now you can see, a lamp well, lampreys can't jump. They cannot jump. The only way they move up upstream is swimming and are sucking onto things and using their mouth to 
take them upstream. So for that culvert, unless it had a ramp, as long as it has water, sure, they could get through it, but it doesn't have a ramp, so there's no way to do it. Also, that the one on the left, those are larvae um, at screens there at the dams where they get, they get hung up on the um, cooling water strainers at the powerhouses. And so um, the, the core has been working on finding solutions to that. So here I wanna talk about one of the bigger threats uh, for lamprey, at least in the Columbia River Basin and the Snake River Basin, it's the dams. So even now with the work that's been done, Um, you know, and this is an average, average, that's 50 at the Dalles, 25 at John Day. By the time you get to low it Dam, you know, one, zero. Um, and so uh, there's work that needs to be done. Now on the right-hand side, I'm showing uh, something that's, there, there's good news. Dam, um, dams have been removed and, uh, and lamprey are, have recolonized like quickly, rapidly, as long as, like I said, as long as they can get upstream, they're going, they're looking for cold, clear water. So those pictures, one's uh, Powerdale Dam in Hood River and Condit Dam in the um, White Salmon River, but also like the Elwha River, they, they removed those dams and the lamprey are just like going crazy returning to those areas. So speaking about um, dams, so the Corps of Engineers, the Army Corps of Engineers through the Columbia Basin Fish Accords have a uh, Done, been, been performing um, improvements to the Columbia River uh, dams. And so from 2008 to 2018, they did a, a whole number of improvements and they're continuing. So we're continuing on, but some of the um, things that have been researched and developed are what are called these lamprey passage structures. So you can see them in the upper right-hand corner here um, and then on the left, you can see some lamprey climbing those, those um, ramps. So it just gets them out of the salmon ladder up and over the dam. It, it helps them to avoid the things that, that cause them difficulties. Also, the other things is if in the ladders, they've rounded corners to keep them be able to keep their suction. They've added um, uh, keyhole entrances that, so they don't have to, to try to make their way up to the uh, taller locations. They near the, and, and they've um, adjusted flow at nighttime when it doesn't affect salmon. Um, a variety of, and they're working on adult and juvenile research management and evaluation. So tag, uh, studies, um, pit tag, acoustic tag, radio tag, and we're just beginning to start doing some juvenile studies because, you know, they have to get upriver, but once they get upriver, well, they have to go back down, the larvae do. So we have to fix that too. Um, and here's an example of, so lamprey, you know, their, their numbers were drastically de declined from historical numbers. Um, it, it has been said that the river was black with eels. And, and in some places it's been said, you could walk across the river on an eel's back, do you know what I mean? So eels meaning lamprey. Um, or it looked like Medusa hair, that picture that Jeremy showed you earlier, Medusa hair. That's how many were on the rocks. And anyway, now Bonneville Dam, all the dams were put in, but here's a, a graph of the counts and that's only day counts at Bonneville Dam. And we can see, um, you know, up to 400,000, even though that's not a million. But anyway, but that's, you know, in 1960s and then they quit counting them. And then here we're down to like 50,000 to 100, down to 20, almost, you know, zero. I mean, really low. So because of this, you know, the tribes, they noticed first um, that lamprey were, were hurting and they sounded the alarm. Um, and like, again, Jeremy also mentioned, they were considered trash fish by some of the region, um, you know, fish biologists or managers or what have you. And so they were purposefully um, poisoned. Um, so it was very damaging. And, but the, the tribes took over, they said, hey, this needs to be changed. 
Um, and then the region got together and and then we'll move on and I can tell you about the things that happened. So anyway, um, so these two pictures show you like the mid Columbia region and the upper Snake River region because I'm sort of talking about those areas, but okay, in blue is the current distribution and in red is historical. So it just kind of, you can easily look at that map and kind of go, okay, um, they're, still, they're still not making it up to those higher reaches. So what can we do to help them? So in came the Tribal Pacific Lamprey Restoration Plan, the Critfic member tribes um, got together and worked to, do, to say, hey, what are we gonna do and how are we gonna do it? And so the vision of the plan was that lamprey will be widely distributed within the Columbia River Basin in numbers that fully provide for ecological, tribal, cultural, and harvest values. And then there were six objectives outlined. So over the years, um, and this plan was in 2011. So over the years, we've been addressing each and every one of these objectives in different ways. But the one I'm gonna talk about here today is more called the supplementation and augmentation. And so that's what we've been doing is translocating fish from the main stem dams to the upper reaches, to the tribes, and then they release them in locations where they previously were, but are near extirpated. So another um, restoration um, action was the conservation initiative which was the US Fish and Wildlife Service, along with, um, it was a cooperative effort with natural resource agencies, including tribes who, um, they got together to reduce the threats to Pacific lamprey and improve their habitats and population status. Part of that um, initiative was that an, a conservation agreement where um, that was to promote the implementation of conservation measures in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and California and then also U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was um, tasked with doing an assessment of Pacific, Pacific lamprey populations and develop plans with um, uh, priority actions that we could take priority and make some changes. And also in 2016, they also, we joined the National Fish Habitat Partnership, which is just another avenue to protect lamprey. This uh, picture is just another one of those, like the one I just showed. It's just showing you red is, you know, um, possibly extirpated or presumed extirpated. So you can see a lot of red there. Black is where they, we haven't, we don't have the data right now, or it's not in this graph. Um, and then, you know, looking at, there's only a little tiny bit of green, even now with all the work that's going on. So we, we continue to work hard and we will keep working hard. So the status in these various states, you know, in Oregon, they're vulnerable and sensitive. In Washington, they're a state monitor species. Idaho, endangered. California, species of special concern. Alaska, species in need of conservation. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a species of concern. So everyone knows they need help. And agencies and regional, the region is working really hard, and especially the tribes who led the, who have led and continue to lead um, in protecting these fish. So now that I'm speaking about the tribes, I'm gonna have uh, four slides here, one for each of our tribes and their, um, and their lamprey projects. So the Umatilla tribe, restore natural production of Pacific lamprey in the tribe's seeded basins to self-sustaining and harvestable levels and evaluate success of restoration to inform management for potential application elsewhere. So Umatilla tribe is one of the tribes that does participate in translocation. And so annually since two, the year 2000, they've been releasing fish in Umatilla River Basin, Grand Ronde River Basin. Um, and uh, it, it's a few hundred to a few thousand a year. It just depends on um, the, the run that year. And, and uh, that's how we get our percentage of how many of the tribes can translocate. And uh, next I'll talk about Yakima tribe. They are another tribe that is doing um, the translocation and theirs is to restore natural production to a level that will provide robust species abundance, significant ecological, ecological contributions and meaningful harvest throughout the Yakima nation seeded lands and in their usual and accustomed areas. 
And again, and the Yakima tribe has been re, uh, releasing in multiple locations from the Yakima River Basin and beyond Metau, um, a, a whole, there's a whole list of locations they've released at. And uh, again, same thing, each of the tribes gets the exact same percentage of fish each year based on the run. Nez Perce tribe, another translocation tribe. Um, theirs, now, you know, their fish have to get up all the dams up to the upper reaches of the Snake River and the, the Clearwater River, and, and they really suffered. They suffered. Um, so the, the mission thwart further local extirpations, prevent loss of pheromone migration cues from larval lamprey, maintain some level of production in the Snake Basin until main stem passage improves. Restore um, lamprey-related ecosystem values to promote diversity, productivity, and ecosystem health, and preserve cultural values associated with lamprey. Now, um, the Warm Springs tribe, they are not a translocation tribe. They have not needed to translocate. Um, they still have some good populations of lamprey in their areas. And so what, what they work on is the Willamette Falls um, they do um, abundance estimates, uh, not abundance, escapement estimates there at Willamette Falls. You can see on the right-hand side, that's uh, Carson McVeigh. He's uh, collected some lamprey and now he's releasing them upstream. Um, and the lower left is the uh, creel surveys for the harvest at Willamette Falls. So they're measuring the fish, they're scanning them for pit tags. And so they can record all this data uh, they also look at, um, lim at status and limiting factors in the Deschutes River, 50 Mile Creek, and Hood River subbasins, and um, a a in, along with others, contaminant analysis, and a variety of things. Now, talking about translocation, so like I said, this guarantees um, that, that adults will get upstream past the dams. It provides for increased larval abundance. We know that that way they, if they successfully spawn, that provides some larvae. Hopefully that provides um, some pheromone scent that will uh, guide or cause adults to want to reach those locations. And um, it, it will increase regional and range-wide adult abundance. Work we do in the Columbia River Basin, you know, uh, in, areas wherever you, you recall the first map, everyone is benefiting from the work that's being done in the Columbia River Basin. Everyone is benefiting. Um, and so here's just our, our lamprey collection crew at one of the dams. So I think I told you when we collect at Bonneville, the Dalles and John Day dams, and then move them upstream. And again, they only are released in locations where they previously uh, used to be um, and it has to be, the habitat has to be in good condition. So we're not trying to bring them upstream and then just dump them somewhere they can't survive. It's, it's very important that they survive. So this map just shows the number of locations where releases occur. The, and then also um, it shows us where the e-fishing is done, where we collect, and um, not to mention out in the ocean, we have received some, some genetic samples from out there. Okay, and so also the, let me just check my time real quick. I think I'm doing okay. So the two of the tribes do artificial propagation of Pacific lamprey. And so we're in, we're still in only phase one of our master plan, our master plan for Pacific lamprey artificial propagation, translocation, restoration, and research. The Umatilla tribe and the Yakima Nation are both involved in this research. Um, they are um, actually world renowned now for their work. Um, the first of their kind to do this with Pacific lamprey. So Ralph Lampman and Aaron Jackson and, and their crews, um, they all have participated in this and also Mary Moser, NOAA Fisheries. So we're just now getting to hopefully get to do phase two, which is releasing our larval lamprey. Um, out planning them, we're finishing up environmental compliance. And if all things go as planned, uh, the first releases will occur in 2021. Um, and the other purpose and need for these for this artificial propagation is to have fish to be able to do some of our biological research and our passage studies. So other things that we do, radio and pits 
telemetry, spawning surveys, genetic monitoring, larval distribution and abundance, and juvenile outmigration. And I'm here to my the last four slides, which basically just kind of kind of put your mind on what you see. Um, these are 10-year averages. In the green is the 10-year average, and the red is this year's. So this year our numbers were down. Um, our counts and note this is just day count at these are day counts not night counts and not including the LPSs and then here's John Day Dam you can see so green is 10 year average red is this year lower granite dam I mean take note only 20 lamprey were counted passing lower granite dam this year so thus the need for translocation and artificial propagation until we can get lamprey above all these dams. And then Wells Dam, again, um, this year there were, it says 20 lamprey counted. So, and that's it. So I can now um, turn it over to John Hess. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lori. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I'm going to share with you some recent research results that Cryptic and its member tribes have been involved in. Um, one of the challenges with studying Pacific lamprey um, is the tiny size of the, the larvae. And uh, this really makes physical tagging uh, impossible. You can imagine a radio tag being attached to a larva, it's almost comical. But we've been developing DNA fingerprinting as a way to track larvae and, and other life stages and have had some success with that. So that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. Now, Lori discussed some of the um, life cycle uh, of, of Pacific lamprey. And just briefly, um, I'm going to go through it again, that they start out as larvae filter feeding. They turn into juveniles as they're migrating to sea. They spend some time in the ocean feeding parasitically. And then the adults return to the freshwater. They overwinter, and then they um, spawn and die. But there can be a lot of details uh, that are missing between these steps, such as, you know, how old are they before migrating? Or where do they go and for how long? And do they actually return home like salmon? We've developed a set of genetic markers for exploring some of these, these data gaps. And uh, this set of genetic markers is about 300 genetic markers that have been pared down from thousands of markers throughout the genome. And we've kind of created a genetic Swiss army knife. Um, it is good for multiple applications such as parentage analysis where we can assign offspring to parents. We can do species identification, which is important because when the larvae are really small, they're too small to use morphological cues to identify. And then there's these adaptive genes that we built into the panel. And they're important because they're linked with fitness traits and it's, um, it allows us to uh, study some of the important adaptations in the species. So what can lamprey genomics do for you? I'm gonna be talking first about this parentage-based tagging application and the use um, of this method for basin-wide research monitoring and evaluation. So as you might have heard, the tribes are involved in trying to return places like Lana Falls uh, to this Medusa hair-like state that you see in this picture from the early 1900s. And they're doing it using translocation. And one of the object objectives, the primary goals of these translocations is to increase larval abundance, at least for some interim period um, that uh, habitat restoration and some of these passage improvements can be done um, to restore the abundance of lamprey. And as a secondary goal, there's this hope that 
you know, not only the larval abundance can be increased, but we can also boost the juvenile and even the adult abundance for the region at large. So the objective of the parentage-based tagging has been to provide direct evidence of these two, two goals. But then in, in the process, we also hope to uh, fill some of these data gaps, you know, learning about the biology, the life stage timing, and the migration behavior. So how do you track the kids? Well, if you're a helicopter parent like myself, you can use a GPS watch. But for Pacific Lamprey, um, we're using the Mendelian inheritance of genes. And what I mean by that is you learn in basic or general biology that uh, everyone has two copies of every gene, and lamprey are similar. So the kid inherits one copy from dad um, and one copy from mom. And if you have enough of these genetic markers, you can do some accurate parentage assignment. We're applying parentage-based tagging on a regional scale, and I'm going to be focused on uh, the Nez Perce and Umatilla seeded areas of uh, where translocations have been ongoing. Um, the basic strategy of this method is that we would go first to uh, some of the sites where adults have been translocated and we would survey the larvae there. And then we kind of follow these larvae as they would be developing and migrating downstream and have another site like at a dam, lower granite dam, um, where we would then encounter larvae and juveniles and sample some of those and also look to see um, if we could find some of these translocation kids. And then further downstream, we can go to another uh, dam that's on the main stem of the Columbia River, John Day, and also pick up some juveniles there and, and see if we can detect uh, any translocation kids. And then even out in the ocean, there's some survey work that we've used to get samples out in the ocean. And the hope is at one point, um, we would like to see some of these translocation fish come back as adults. And so we're also uh, sampling adults at um, abundance hotspots like Willamette Falls and Bonneville Dam. So this is kind of a scale issue. And the way this works is, you know, at the smallest scale, it's a point where um, fish get translocated. I'm using an example of Newsom Creek, which is a small creek about 67 square miles uh, in Idaho, in the Clearwater River Basin. And at the mouth of Newsom Creek, you can see a small little white object there. This is a screw trap. And this trap is positioned so that it can collect larvae and juveniles coming out of Newsom Creek. And um, what we are expecting is that Newsom Creek was chosen um, similar to the way other sites around the Snake River were chosen, that um, they hadn't been detecting Pacific lamprey at all in previous years. And so once translocation started, we think that uh, adults that were translocated are only the only fish that are spawning there. And so over the course of the past decade, we have on average about 40 fish being released in Newsom Creek over the years. And um, we would expect that all the larvae coming out of Newsom Creek, 100% of them would be um, translocation fish. And so this yellow line is showing you the percentage that we would expect would be translocation. There's one year that we had zero fish um, released there, and so we expect 0% from that year. Like I said, this drainage area is about 67 square miles. Um, and next, we want to choose a medium scale. And so for that, we're going 180 uh, river miles downstream of Newsom Creek um, to Lower Granite Dam. And this is a much larger section of river. At Lower Granite Dam, uh, we're not just um, expecting Newsom Creek fish, but all the different sites that have been translocated to on the Snake River Basin. Um, but not only are there translocated adults, um, we also expect volitional return. So fish that on their own volition have returned to lower granite dam. And so on average over the past decade, we would expect about 44% of fish to be from translocations because that's um, the ratio of translocated adults to these volitional returns. At lower granite dam, uh, the samples that we're getting are opp opportunistic. Um, they're 
these mortalities of fish that have been impinged on a, a cooling screen um, at the dam. And the drainage area above Lower Granite is 103,000 square miles, so quite a sc scale up from that Newsom Creek drainage. And our next scale is our Grande scale. So for that, we're going to go 200 miles downstream of Lower Granite to John Day, which is on the main stem of the Columbia River. And John Day is uh, an even larger section of river. Now we're talking about um, an expectation of about 2%. That's 2% on average um, each year that uh, we would expect to be from the Snake River translocation because the um, number of adults that were translocated to the, the snake make up a much smaller percentage to the volitional returns coming back to the John Day. The John Day receives um, a range of, you know, you can have 700 um, fish one year, um, up to 70,000 fish. And so it, it's quite a scale up. The drainage area here is 226,000 square miles. But now for our Godzilla scale um, is the Pacific Ocean. And for that, we're gonna have to scale way out, way above uh, the Columbia River and um, go the remaining distance downstream that's 200 river miles downstream to the, the Pacific Ocean. And here, as I mentioned before, we have a series of arrays that um, we're using to, to survey fish out in the ocean. Is this, um, is this a, a needle in the haystack type of scenario? Um, it could very well be. Um, the drainage area here is represented well, the, the ocean represents a drainage of about 3.9 million uh, square, square miles of streams and rivers um, exiting to the Pacific Ocean. And so this is a 17-fold increase in scale from the Columbia River. And we would expect that the Snake River translocation fish would make up maybe 0.1% of all the fish out there. So you'd have to sample about 1,000 fish just to get one. Okay, so you're ready for some results now. Um, so going back to the, the smallest scale we have is Newsom Creek. And we're also not only going to this scale, but we're going to start from the very um, uh, initiation of translocation. That was in 2007 when 50 adults were translocated to Newsom Creek. Um, it took a while uh, before seeing any larvae that came out of this system, but in 2012, a bunch of larvae came out in the screw trap and Nez Perce sent them to us, we genotyped them, um, and 100% turned out to be the offspring of these 50 adults that um, were translocated back in 2007. So 100% assigned. And then uh, that would be age five. In the next year, another set of larvae came out in this trap and they would be age six, and 98% of them assigned back to this first set of adults in 2007. Over the subsequent years, um, the numbers diminished from this cohort, but even up to uh, 2017, they would be age 10. They were still trickling out um, as, as larvae from the system. When we consider going downstream to lower granite, this solid line shows um, the relative proportion of this same cohort at Lower Granite, and they actually peaked at age nine in 2016. And so in summary, you have five-year-olds exiting Newsom Creek. Um, they're going, they're traveling 180 river miles downstream, and at age nine on average, they're passing Lower Granite Dam as juveniles. And so that's a remarkable um, transformation and journey. Was this a boost to larval abundance? You bet. I mean, 100% assigned to this first set of adults. So that was a success. But in order to see if uh, they're having any kind of boost to any of the, the later life stages, we have to go, um, we have to scale up and go downstream. And to do that, we look at Lower Granite Dam and we're not just considering Newsom Creek, that cohort anymore. We're considering all translocation kids um, coming out of the Snake River and passing Lower Granite Dam. We started surveying at Lower Granite in 2011. We didn't see anything from the translocation. Until about 2013, we saw 2% of all the juveniles there um, being attributed to these translocations. 
And then by 2018, a fifth of all the fish passing Lower Granite Dam as juveniles um, were coming from these translocation fish. So was this a boost to juvenile abundance? It wasn't quite what we were expecting. We were thinking that it would be more around 44% but it seems to be increasing each year and we're hopeful that that increase is going to continue. But this is possibly a boost to juvenile abundance. I still have to remind you that we were getting opportunistic samples and all of these were unfortunately mortalities on this turbine screen. So we weren't sure if all these translocation efforts were futile and they were just getting screened out of the system and not going any further downstream. So in order to answer that question, we had to scale up again so just looking at Lower Granite Dam, uh, in 2017, we were finding about 11% were coming from those translocation adults. They were the, juven or the juveniles from those translocation fish. Looking downstream at John Day Dam, um, we were looking at all Snake River fish, not just translocations, all Snake River fish in, in red, the volitional ones. Um, and then the ones in yellow are from the translocation but all fish together from the Snake River made up a third of all juveniles from um, coming through John Day Dam, which was very remarkable because um, the numbers of adults passing John Day each year and ending up in Lower Granite is just a small portion of the total return to John Day, about 5%. So to see a third of all fish, all juveniles coming out um, that was uh, quite an overrepresentation of the Snake River, and we were very happy to see that, but also extremely happy to see that the Snake River translocation um, progeny were at 3% that year. And if you remember um, my expectation, it was about 2%. So we're already surpassing that expectation, which is really good news. And that really shows that we're having a juvenile uh, boost uh, of abundance. Moving out to the ocean, uh, we looked to see if we could see anything um, from upstream, and we did find that Snake River comprised about 1%, a small slice of the pie. Um, we didn't find any translocation fish, but we think it's a little bit too early, and we may not be sampling enough. Um, like I said, about 0.1% would be what we'd be expecting. So we'd have to sample 1,000 just to get one. Now, um, I've been mentioning that we'd love to see um, some of these adults, or some of these translocation fish return as adults. It may be too early to detect that right now, but we'd still like to get some information about how many fish we should expect um, to return uh, in the future. Um, this would help us address whether the translocations will have a boost to adult abundance in the Columbia River. One thing that um, we'd like to know before we even get to that point is where do they go when they're in the ocean? Um, we don't really have um, a good sense of the overall average of um, where they're being distributed, but one of the extreme, oops, sorry about that. One of the extreme data points that we do have is um, one fish that was collected in the Bering Sea. Um, it ended up having a brother or sister that was later discovered coming back as an adult um, to Oregon City, Willamette Falls in Oregon City in 2018. We don't know where these fish uh, were born, but to have one sibling show up in the Bering Sea and one sibling to show up as an adult, Willamette Falls, that's an incredible journey. So coming back to the adult returns at Willamette Falls and Bonneville, you know, one of the things that we've been able to do is um, sample large numbers of juveniles that have been leaving the system in the Snake River um, over time. Each year, we've gotten a large set of juveniles that are leaving the Snake River, 2010 through 2015. We started looking at Willamette Falls among the adults that returned there to see if we could find any of the, the relatives, the brothers and sisters of those juveniles that left the Snake River, show up at Willamette Falls as adults. We didn't see anything for a long time until 2017. We saw a little blip um, from the Snake River um, from that cohort in 2011 show up. And at Bonneville, that same cohort from 2011 showed up in even larger numbers. We're talking 0.4% of the adult return in 2017 and over 3% of the adult return in, in 2017 at Bonneville. This would make them a six ocean fish. So they, they would have spent 
on average six years in the ocean before returning as adults, um, which is incredible. And so some of this information is really redefining what, what we knew about Pacific lamprey in terms of how long they spend in the ocean. The next part of the um, marker panel that I'll be discussing the functionality is the species ID. And so we have some markers in this genetic panel that can tell Pacific lamprey from some of the other resident species in the Columbia River Basin, the Lampetra uh, genus. And um, with this genetic marker, Pacific lamprey have these two blue copies of this marker and Lampetra have these two green copies. It's a highly accurate marker. What we can do with it is use it to understand um, the species distribution of these, these various lampreys. Um, but one application for conservation is um, looking at or documenting a, a natural recolonization. And right here in our backyard in the gorge, um, Powerdale Dam was taken out in 2010. In 2012, um, fish were, or larvae were, were found um, just upstream of that dam site. And 60 of them were sent to us. We genotyped them and we found that most of them turned out to be Pacific lamprey. So this is one tool that we have um, to document uh, natural reintroduction. Um, these larvae would be too small to um, uh, identify using morphological traits. So the, the last part of my talk is the futuristic part of the talk um, where we're predicting fate based on genotype. And so what I mean by that, um, we, we have thousands of genetic markers throughout the genome that we've been able to identify. Um, we've targeted a, a gene on chromosome two that appears to be associated with body size. And so taking this genetic marker and genotyping many fish, we found that if, this, if a particular fish had two A copies of this genetic marker, they tended to be larger on average. And if they had two C copies of this marker, they tended to be smaller. So um, this was a, a marker that we could use to study this trait. We also targeted a gene on chromosome one and this gene, after genotyping many fish, we discovered that it was associated with female maturity. And so if you had two copies of the A gene at this marker, uh, you tended to be more mature as a female. And if you had two uh, C copies, you tended to be less mature. And if you were less mature, you may need to hunker down and overwinter. Maybe being more mature, you could, you could spawn right away. What we can do with these genetic markers is create this gene map. And so instead of doing the hard work of going out, finding all these adults all over the species range and measuring every single one for body size, what we can do instead is find um, the larvae, which are a lot easier to catch. And you can genotype them and using their genes, we can predict um, what their traits, their body traits would be based on these genes. And so this genetic map shows in the the warmer colors, um, what we would predict to be the smaller body size fish, and in the cooler colors, the larger body size fish. And you can see that um, the coastal areas tend to um, receive more of the small bodied ones, the interior areas tend to receive more of the large body fish. We can do the same thing with female maturity and make a gene map. And here again, you can see that there's these coastal areas that um, have these warmer colors associated with this more mature uh, female and the interior areas have these cooler colors associated with the less mature female. Um, we can also study um, how these genes are distributed through time by looking at adults that are returning to Willamette Falls over the course of the season. And so here we have plotted out um, over the course of weeks, these adults returning and what their, their genes are saying that they are and um, the more mature fish are coming in earlier in the run versus the less mature fish are coming in later. And it seems like, again, these more mature fish coming in earlier could possibly spawn that same year. But these uh, less mature fish might need to overwinter uh, before spawning in the Willamette. So what this allows us to do is make this hypothesis testing framework. We can have our gene map of maturity and look at four different geographic regions. We can have our gene map of body size and look at the same four areas. And then we can take this uh, white area and look at um, 
what it tells us about the fish. Um, in this case, it's telling us that we're predicting large bodied fish that are premature up in these interior areas of the Columbia River. Whereas in Northern California, we're predicting more mature fish, but large bodied fish. And in Puget Sound um, and Vancouver Island, we would pre predict uh, smaller bodied fish that are more mature. So this is really the, the science fiction part of the, the study. And uh, to borrow a quote from a good sci-fi movie, Gattaca, there's no gene for the lamprey spirit, but we may have a gene for body size and maturity. So in summary, um, did we find a boost to larval abundance um, that the translocation programs were able to deliver? Yes, uh, we found 100% in Newsom Creek were from the first translocation adults. Did we find a boost to juvenile abundance? Yes, again, in uh, Lower Granite Dam, just downstream of the Snake River Basin, we found 10%, um, over 10% of juveniles were from the translocation. Going downstream to John Day, 3% were from these Snake River translocations. Was there a boost to adult abundance? We may see that in the near future. We don't have the data for that now. And then how long is the ocean phase? Well, we saw something um, as, as old as six years from the interior Columbia River. We'll have to look at um, adults from other areas to see if that holds up. Where do they go? We have one data point to the Bering Sea. Do they return home? Well, kind of. I mean, they, the Snake River fish um, came to uh, Bonneville Dam as a larger proportion of them came to Bonneville Dam versus Willamette Falls. And Bonneville is a little bit closer to where they would be headed if they were going back to the Snake River. What species are identified with the genetic markers we have? The Lampetra uh, species complex versus the Pacific lamprey. How is body size distributed in space? Well, the coastal areas have more small bodied fish and the interior areas are predicted to have more of the, the large bodied fish. And how is maturity distributed through time? Well, from our data, the mature fish seem to come in early in the, the run and the less mature fish come in later. And so finally, I'll just end with um, exhibits A, B, and C that are from my kids' drawings and kind of show that there is some evidence to a, a genetic basis for a fascination with Pacific lamprey. Um, but there's also some bribery involved in that. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, John. All right. So I, I get to be the final like kind of the wrap up here um and yeah thank you uh Lori and john and uh hopefully i'll everyone got uh, kind of like some a little snippet there of like what this amazing creature is and uh the kind of the science and research going into them that are really not very well uh understood just because they've kind of been the forgotten fish uh so what i'm what i'm closing with is actually just a, few, a couple of slides about some of our work of like what you know including stuff that we're doing th this tonight of uh, educating people about lamprey um because i think that like those two are those uh, in, uh pictures that john's daughter drew of, of lamprey like once people start learning about them they kind of get intrigued by them and are kind of like even kind of fall in love with them and so a big part of uh what what i do in public outreach about lamprey is really just kind of introducing people to to these creatures and then they take over from there and uh kind of show just uh give that charm uh a, a last or a couple of years ago it was in 2018 the 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 critfic partnered with the oregon zoo and the u.s fish and wildlife service to bring lamprey to the to the Oregon Zoo, and we really, I mean, it's a. If you haven't been to it, I highly recommend it. It it, it really merges the not only the biological aspects of the fish uh, uh, and and the level or things to protect them and things are being done, but also weaves in a whole story and narrative about the tribal connection to lamprey. So you kind of get to learn this, uh, the connection there. And uh, I've talked in, since then, I've talked to the zookeeper and I've said that she said that there are multiple times where she's overheard kids saying that that's their favorite thing at the zoo. That's the first thing that they want to see when they come to the zoo, it's a lamprey. So um, we're kind of like, 
once these kids are introduced to them, they uh, hopefully will become future lamprey advocates and to be friend, you know, befriend this species that need need all of our help. And uh, hopefully you got a little taste of that as well tonight, that it kind of piqued your interest in in uh, in these creatures and uh, efforts to restore them. So um, in closing, actually, I'm going to show a um, just the last two, it's about, it's about two and a half minute of, of a video that we produced um, in uh, a couple years ago about um, lamprey and, and uh, lamprey restoration with for the, the tribes are doing. Um, and this uh, really, um, I think, kind of encapsulates some of this work and why we do it. In 1972, down on that far end is where I seen the eel coming up the river. And I followed him clear on up to the cut bank up there. And he went into the dark. And that was him telling me it's time for me to leave. I followed him as far as he wanted me to. But then after I thought about it, what it was all about, it was someone talking to me saying, we got a problem. And that was the last eel I went and seen in here. And that was in 1972. So the significant part of it for me is after 40 years, I finally get to bring some of his family back and put him into this stream, which means a lot to me because they belong here. started, I knew if I said anything, all they would have done was throw me in the bucket as being a rowdy Indian. So we came a long ways. The whole idea of this is for Lampering to come full circle, you know, and not just the Umatilla River, but the Columbia Basin, and not just the Columbia Basin, their entire range. And we're getting those fish and we're placing them right in this prime spawning habitat. We've been out planting Lamprey here since 2000. We've been monitoring adult returns. Every year we'd see about five, 10, maybe 15 adult lamprey return. And uh, this year we had 129 lamprey return in the Imatilla River. It gives us a sense of hope that this might be possible, you know, that we might be going down the right road here to bring lamprey back. to provide passive structures for lamprey to be able to make it up over the system so eventually you know hopefully these fish can survive on their own and they don't need us going down to the main stem dam you know they'll be able to make those treks on their own improvements that we're making here in the Umatilla and improvements that other tribes are doing in other basins in the columbia you know may not be things you know that uh, we get to see the benefit of you know in, in our lifetime i'm working for generations after me you know and Hopefully my, my kids' kids or their grandkids will be able to, you know, harvest lamprey here in the Umatilla again at some point. It's a milestone for me because it's just a beginning. So I'm going to close with this quote that actually is from my dad who was featured in the video. And also it's, it's uh, appears at the end of the exhibit, the Lamper exhibit. It's his question of how do we let something that's 450 million years old go extinct? Uh, and so I, I hope that uh, this, this presentation's inspired you to kind of take up the charge with us because we're not, we're, we're only by working together are we gonna be able to protect something or protect these creatures and uh, and say, you know what, it's they've been around here for this long and they're not gonna go uh, extinct on our watch. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, thank you so much. And if all of you don't mind turning on your video so we can see you again, thank you so much, Jeremy, Lori and John for the amazing work that you and Critfic are doing to restore lamprey. We, we have some questions for you. Um, and thank you to everyone who sent in a question. We're gonna now open up for Q&A.
And again, reminder just to send in your questions to Q&A and not the chat box so we don't miss them. And we're just gonna jump right into it real quick. Um, so from, here we go. For either of you, um, how do you cook lamprey and how do you clean them prior to cooking? Um, well, I guess I could I can start with that. Generally, they're cooked with. Um, I've seen over like shown the pictures over a fire, so um, they can kind of drip down and roast because they're a very oily fish, um, or or dried are the most common ways. But I've seen them like people grilling them on their barbecue or whatnot as well, um, and then cleaning them is actually a little bit simpler than you know than even a fish because they don't have any bones. So once you slice them open, you just need to take out the guts and there's not really anything else that you have to do to uh, prepare them. I, um, I've actually cooked them on a Traeger before. <laughs> and uh, Bobby Begay always told me that the, the notochord uh, with a natural th thermometer because it pops out um, when they, they get done. And then um, we have another question here. I've heard that salmon do not eat after they return from the ocean to spawn. Do lamprey, do lamprey eat after they return? Um, they do not eat. They cease eating out in the ocean. They drop off their host. And then from that period on, they, um, they don't eat even for up to two to three years. So they have to put a lot of, a lot of weight or, um, fat on themselves out in the ocean. And, and also the, uh, on that regard, the, the zookeeper at the Oregon Zoo said that she, they're the, the, mo the easiest uh, animals that she has to care for because she doesn't even have to feed them. Mm -hmm. uh, and how actually that program is really nice where they've partnered with the Umatilla tribe and that's where the, the lamprey come from that are on exhibit. So they will, generally the lamprey they'll capture them and then they have to hold them in facilities to overwinter and, uh, and until they're ready to spawn and then they'll take them in out into the wild to spawn. So when they do the initial collection, instead of taking them to their holding facility, they'll take five or 10, however many at the zoo, bring them to the zoo where they just get to hang out in the kind of the luxury of the Oregon Zoo. Um, and then when it, when they do the next collection, they just come and swap them. In fact, the first uh, the first grouping that had gotten uh, been on exhibit, they were retrieved and they got to spawn in the wild and in, in nature in the on the Umatilla reservation. So it's uh... that's awesome. And then from Kathleen again for anyone, um, how closely are they related to eels? Um, I think I tried to type that in. Uh, so eels are bony fish and ray fin fish. So they're in a different place on the, the tree. Um, lamprey are at the base being the agnathans lacking jaws and bones. So um, not, not closely related at all, even though they look so very I think similar. Somebody, somebody asked about um... Uh, the eel that you have in sushi and it's, yeah, it's not lamprey. Um, it would be raised in a freshwater farm. So. And then I see a few questions about people are really trying to understand how do they get up the falls? So, you know, once they let go of suction, how do they, how do they clamp again? Like, how, how does that work? Do they just go really fast? Pretty much, and they kind of do a thing with their bodies where they almost, they, we should have a video of that. It's, it's very interesting. They use their whole body to move themselves up, not just their mouth, but. Yeah, they, it was, in, if it, it was like a little snippet of it in that final, the final video, there was a couple of scenes where you saw them doing that. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, and you can, if anyone's interested in watching that whole program, it's available on the Cryptic website. If you search Lamprey, um, it's, it's a link so you can watch the whole thing. And it, apparently the, um, the climbing ability of Pacific Lamprey is not common among lampreys. Um, there are not many other species that can climb a vertical surface or yeah, a vertical face, a rock face like Pacific lamprey can. 
sea lamprey didn't get into the Great Lakes because of being great climbers and getting over Niagara Falls. They got in there because of the canal system. Mm -hmm. And then um, Mark, this is from Mark, with the proposed removal of four lower Klamath dams, what predictions can we expect for lamprey populations? I, I think that um, for one thing, uh, you know, the, opening up all that available habitat way up into the interior of the Klamath is um, likely going to be similar to the way Columbia River operates and that the Snake River Basin used to get um, some of the largest lamprey because, you know, they had the longest distances to travel and it um, really required a large um, fish to make it up there. And I would imagine that um, the Klamath River Basin would be opening up habitat that would promote some of these large fish um, uh, making, uh, having success up in the interior and providing that critical habitat for those large fish up there. So um, I don't know if that's a prediction other, you know, rather than just saying that it would be good to have that kind of habitat available for Pacific lamprey to, to make use of. Yeah. Thank you. And then from Jay, what did the earliest lampreys eat in an ocean, you know, when salmon and other, you know, fish or, or hosts for them to, to latch onto were not there yet? What, what did they eat on? Um, I think that's a kind of a mystery. <laughs> Nobody was know. there. <laughs> what unknown? They seem they pretty flexible, though. I mean, to have um, so many different prey species today um, that Lori showed in her slide, um, you know, even, even the, the whales um, seem to be a potential prey item for lamprey, um, or at least um, a means to travel. So. Uh, lamprey are definitely the highest predator out there in the ocean. Um, the, studying the trophic level of lamprey, um, you go from you know, the larval stage being the filter feeding trophic level, which is one of the lowest, um, and then going, from going to adults where they're above sharks out there in the ocean because they're feeding on all the top predators out there. So, um, they do have a very flexible means to adapt to prey. And I would imagine that they would have been eating dinosaurs and um, whatever else was uh, swimming around in the ocean. They'd just be as happy as can be. Awesome. Um, from Karen, are the, are the dams worse for returning adults or juveniles going, at, um, going out? Do, do you guys know if there's anything that we know about that? Well, we can't really say which one's worse. Um, we're just beginning to be able to study the larval or juveniles out migration because they had to develop a miniaturized tag that could be used in the juveniles. And it's only gone through a pilot study. So in the next five years, we'll begin to see how they move through the dams and so that we can understand, you know, what where they're having challenges and um, how much of a challenge. You know, we do find a lot of mortalities on the screens. So we don't know how many that is in comparison to how many get over the, the dams or what. So, um, but it's difficult both directions and they have to deal with predators too, you know. So um, yeah, it, it, it's really hard to say. Thankfully, we can translocate them right now. I'm from Tom, I assume lampreys are getting to the upper Willamette. What is the impact of large wakes from boating on the lamprey? If, if any, if any. Mm. The impact of large lakes, so the dams creating reservoirs up in the um, large wakes, sorry, yeah. from boating. Oh, okay. From boats. I, I don't know what um, wakes, you know, so um, lamprey, uh, as adults, when they're moving, 
Willamette Falls, um, the the water just below Willamette Falls is actually extremely deep, and uh, the lamprey can go down to the bottom and um, just hole up there in some of these deep holes um, for long periods of time. I would imagine that um, they could kind of travel along the the bottom of the of the river and um, not even notice the the wakes of the boats, but um, that's something that we don't really know or have studied. Yeah, and, and then an, another potential impact there would be more of on the juveniles if they're in the mud along there. But they're actually, I mean, it's it that's a big the bigger risk would be from dewatering if it was like a, a reservoir draw, draw down and where those juveniles might be they might if they dry out, but a wake is probably gonna have the same effect on all the juveniles either. Thank you. From Michael, uh, what makes the lamprey so sought after in the West, but considered so invasive in the East and Midwest? Well, um, they are an invasive species in the Great Lakes region, so they're impacting the native species terribly. Uh, and so, like John said, um, they went through the canals when those were opened up. And however, there are sea lamprey that are not invasive that are actually, you know, um, that folks still care about in, in that they're not trying to get rid of them. So our, the Pacific lamprey are native and so they belong. And as we noted, being the almost the first fish, um, they have so much benefit to the ecosystem and to salmon and all the fish that depend upon them is in whatever manner. So um, being that they're native is probably the biggest um, thing. Definitely. And then um, next one here, how do you determine the age of a lamprey? Very difficult. Um, so <laughs> There aren't really great aging um, structures that can be used for uh, lamprey. Um, in bony fishes, um, scientists have been able to use the, the ear bone, um, the otolith, um, as a, a good aging technique. The otolith uh, deposits year after year. There's layers that um, can be sectioned like a tree, and you can read the rings um, like you would read a tree. But lamprey don't have that, and the you know the analogous structure in lamprey is the the ear bone um, equivalent is the statolith, which is um, kind of cartilaginous, and uh, it does not uh, deposit um, each year of its life, and it's very difficult to age with. Um, so really, I mean, we're we're kind of using these DNA fingerprints as a way to um, age these fish accurately because. If we know when the parents spawned, we know where they spawned. Um, once we assign uh, their kid to those parents, then we know um, the age that the, the kid was. So um, the parentage analysis is actually providing us a, a very nice, accurate way of aging them all throughout their lifetime. And we should be able to get a total age uh, once we start seeing adults return from these translocated parents. But It'll take a while. Their life cycle is a lot longer than we were expecting. Um, and to see a 10-year-old fish still rearing in freshwater as a larvae, um, and then to see adults um, lasting as much as six years in the ocean, I mean, they could be a 20-year fish um, uh, once they, they finally die. And so, um, unfortunately, we don't have that that long of a lifespan ourselves to uh, study many generations of these fish, but we do hope that we'll eventually get to see the total uh, lifespan and get some numbers on those. And then I just want to say thanks again, everyone, for staying in your questions. We can only take one or two more because I'm looking at the time and we, we've got to end it, but thank you again for sending them in. Um, uh, it's so hard to pick one or two more. Um, one is, is the Portland Harbor Superfund site significantly impacting lamprey with the toxic sediment? 
do you, either of you know about that, that project site? Well, we do know that Lamprey use that area and they migrate through there. It's a mi migratory um, corridor as well as a place where we would expect larvae to be in that segment. And then there is monitoring going on. So um, yeah, I, it, it, it has to affect them for sure. Yeah, particularly like the juvenile, like the adults, they don't eat, they swim more in the water column. It's not like they're like down in the kind of rooting around in it, but like those poor juveniles, they're like literally buried in that sediment and they're feeding, filter feeding through those very, uh, you know, contaminated sediments. So uh, kind of getting, getting a dose, right. Um, you know, just from um, being living right in the problem area, which also makes yeah. a, a problem too, with like cleaning up the, the Superfund site of how much that will impact. Because if there's potentially a decade's worth of you know, 10 different years uh, juveniles that could be living in that same stretch and you just pull it all up to like take it to a landfill, you could have potentially taken away, you know, a decade's worth of, of juvenile lamprey. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we, I think we have to end it there. I'm so sorry, everybody. We can't get to everybody's questions. I'm looking at a few of these and I'm going, ah. Um, I just want to thank you, each of you, Jeremy, John, Lori. Thank you so much again for for giving us your time and um, sharing all of the amazing work that you're doing. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you for reconnecting us to this fish that we share home with. And I hope everyone, um, of course, learned a lot about lamprey, but also reconnected and, and see the critical importance of keeping these fish in the rivers. So thank you so much again for joining us and taking time out of your busy schedules tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone has questions, they can find us on the Cryptic website and just go ahead and directly email us at work and we can finish answering your questions. So. And I just want to, I'll read a few of the comments. Thanks, you know, for an interesting presentation. Thanks so much. I learned so much. Um, you know, really educational, wonderful educational program. So thank you again, everyone. Have a have a good night. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.